a Book of the Month Club selection and companion to our series. Inside, you'll find more than 1,600 entries for authors, literary works, and important literary movements. And now from Baltimore, Maryland, American Writers II, the 20th Century, as we examine the life of one of the most influential literary critics of the 20th century, H.L. Mencken. Extraordinarily hot in summer and filthy. It was full of flies, mosquitoes. All kinds of epidemics were running simultaneously. But the people liked it. Food was cheap. Houses were comfortable, although we slept under mosquito nets. And uh, I looked back on it with great affection. I realized its limitations. There were no sewers. And the uh, water supply was bad. Typhoid raged all summer, smallpox all winter, malaria at all times of the year. I had malaria, but I escaped typhoid and smallpox. How? I don't know. Those are the words of H.L. Mencken from a 1948 interview. He spent most of his life here in Baltimore. We're coming to you from the Union Square neighborhood, walking along Holland Street. H.L. Mencken came here at the age of three in 1883. He died here at 1524 Holland Street in 1956 at the age of 75. For the next two hours, we will take a closer look at H.L. Mencken, author, editor, critic, newspaper reporter with the Baltimore Sun. He wrote 30 books, including the American language, and yet he never left far from Holland Street, spending his entire life here in Baltimore. And we're joined by Marion Elizabeth Rogers, who has edited a number of books on H.L. Mencken and also coming out with a new biography. What is it about this man that we need to know to better understand who he was as a person and the times that he wrote about? Well, Mencken was one of America's foremost humorists. He's ranked second to Mark Twain. He had a wonderful style of writing. The humorist S.J. Perlman said that he put adrenaline into the gray and pulpy style of the day. But I think what makes him most relevant right now is that well, we're undergoing a major sea change in the world where the concept of freedom is very, very important. But Mencken stood for that freedom. He was fighting for the civil liberties of all Americans, including African Americans, saying things that few people were saying in those times. Uh, one of his contemporaries, Gerald Johnson, said it best. He said, wit and words are what made Mencken entertaining, but honesty and courage are what made him great. We will be hearing the words of Megan over the next uh, two hours. He talks a lot about life as a reporter. His first job in 1903, worked for the Baltimore Morning Herald, later went to the Baltimore Sun. What was happening at the time, here in this city and around the country? Well, uh, Baltimore, it was, it was the year before the Great Baltimore Fire of 1904. Baltimore was one of the major seaports on the, sea, on the East Coast, ranked uh, after New York City. Theodore Roosevelt was president at the time, and those are some of the, the, the key things that were going on. What was the H.L. Mencken writing style? Oh, well, it was still rather archaic in those days. Uh, it, was, it was very lively. He took as his, uh, as his mentorship the pages of the New York Sun, but uh, it wasn't the style that we celebrate today. We want to welcome you to uh, the second part of C-SPAN's American Writer Series as we look at the life and works of H.L. Mencken, and we welcome your participation as well. The number's on your screen, 202-585-3890 for those of you in the Eastern and Central time zones, and for those of you in the Mountain and Pacific time zones, 202-585-3891. We're joined by Marion Elizabeth Rogers, who first came across the works of H.L. Mencken when? Well, when I was a student at Goucher College in 1981, I was actually writing a, a, an article about Sarah Hart, uh, Mencken's wife, who went to school at Goucher. 
and uh, I was writing it for a school newspaper and I went to the uh, rare book room and I actually tripped over a box and it was the box of love letters between Mencken and Sarah Hart and on top of the box was a label that said do not open until 1981 signed H.L. Mencken and the year was 1981 it was two weeks from my graduation so I guess it's one of those acts of serendipity that all biographers speak of you don't necessarily find your subject your subject finds you and what did you learn about his style his style through those letters well that uh, he was a wonderful prankster had a uh, had a delicious sense of teasing and nonsense that he could actually be quite courtly to to this particular individual to sarah hart who was uh, one of many girlfriends i must say at the time as we take a walk along holland street is this pretty typical of Baltimore row houses at the time? Well, yes. Uh, this is, uh, this Union Square is actually quite historic. It was deeded to the city after the Civil War. It was uh, primarily a uh, German-American neighborhood during the, uh, d during uh, the 1880s up to the 1920s or so. Uh, Mencken loved this home. He said it was as important to him as his own two hands. And this home directly behind us he lived here all but just a couple of years when he was married. Right. He lived, he moved here when he was three years old during those five years of marriage to Sarah from 1930 to 1935. He lived on Cathedral Street. But uh, this was his home and uh, this was his refuge from the rest of the world. And paint a picture of what life was like during the time that he lived here, this street, this neighborhood in particular. Well, uh, Mencken was, uh, grew up here during the era of cobblestones. Uh, this was a very quiet neighborhood. In fact, it was considered almost countryside in the 1880s. Of course, it's not that way anymore. Uh, and uh, during the 20s and 30s, uh, the, the neighborhood experienced various changes, especially during the 40s when you had all the different war workers coming in to build ships and things for World War II. Right now, Union Square is experiencing a wonderful, a wonderful uh, renovation. A lot of new families are moving into this neighborhood. It's, it's very heartening to see it coming back. Before we get to the first call, just give our audience a sense of where we're at here at Union Square, where Baltimore is, the neighborhood around here, the library down the street that H.L. Mencken frequented as a boy. Yes. Well, the library was the number two branch of the Enoch Pratt Free Library. What many people don't realize is that Mencken was self-educated. His education did not go past a high school. So he always liked to say that the Enoch Pratt Free Library was his university. and. Uh, uh, he, he, just, he just loved this neighborhood and he loved this city. In fact, when he would go to uh, New York to edit his magazines, he, uh, he always was relieved when the train was headed south and that he was coming back to Baltimore. Our focus today is on H.L. Mencken. We'll get a call from Decatur, Georgia. Good afternoon. Welcome to the program. Good afternoon, Steve. Uh, this is a great series. I'm so happy that you're back on the air after that long delay. I'd like to ask the guest, um, what were Mencken's religious beliefs? Now, my reading of Mencken indicates that he was a, an agnostic or, at, at worst, an atheist. And if, he, and if he was, did his readers understand that? Did they know that? And did it matter? And also, briefly, what were his early religious beliefs? training, if, if any, or what, what church was he involved with. Thank you very much. Yes, well, Mencken was an agnostic, and everybody knew it. Uh, he was decried across the pulpits across America, but his, uh, his devoted readers didn't mind. Uh, Mencken actually was very well versed in the subjects of religion. He used to have wonderful theological discussions with rabbis and priests, and in fact, wrote one of his favorite books which was called Treatise on the Gods that came out in 1930. Uh, but as for his, uh, he, he, and he didn't hold it against anyone who was religious and in fact he said uh, when he arrived to the great pearly gates he would say, and if he met the twelve apostles he would say, gentlemen 
I was wrong. But the fact is, uh, he, his early religious training, he did go to Sunday school, but uh, his, his father sent him there only because he wanted to sleep late on Sundays. And caller, there was an interview, and you're going to be hearing some of the audio from this Donald Kirkley interview that was conducted at the Library of Congress in 1948, actually just a couple of months before he suffered his debilitating stroke uh, in 1948. And during that interview, he talked about uh, being an agnostic and also some of the superstitions that he had. Let's listen in. Or the man who believes that Friday is an unlucky day. I should add at once that I am one of those who do believe that Friday is an unlucky day. And uh, uh, like, like nearly all agnostics, I'm very superstitious. And I would no more undertake any work of importance on Friday the 13th than I'd jump off a house. You are still an agnostic. You oh, held very faithfully to that. Yeah. I was born an agnostic. My father was one ahead of me and his father ahead of him. So agnosticism is nothing new to me. I'll point out a, a, one of the strange corollaries, and that is this. A man who is an agnostic by inheritance so that he doesn't remember any time that he wasn't, has almost no hatred for the religious. I, I get on very well with all kinds of ecclesiastics and all kinds of pious people because I don't uh, have any uh, evil conscience in the matter. I'm not a renegade. No the, feeling of sin. No feeling of sin, whatever. I assume that they've got a right to believe anything they please. H.L. Mencken from that 1948 interview. Another call from Bethesda, Maryland. Good afternoon. Hi. I was privileged to be a student at Baltimore City College, which is a high school, public high school in Baltimore. We now, now call it probably a magnet school. We didn't know what the word magnet was then. Back during World War II and shortly thereafter, when Mencken would make his annual visit to Mr. Pence's English class and to the Carrollton White and Bancroft Literary Societies, that he would address in the afternoon. And I can tell you the reaction of the students when he came to City College was unbelievable. This man... Caller, how old are you now? I'm now 73. How, how old are you? I'm 73. So how old were you when he came to your school? Uh, I was a high school student. I was uh, in, in my teens. And, of course, um, we didn't know who Mencken was the first time. <clears throat> but after he arrived, boy, did we know who he was. He, he <laughs> did more to stimulate learning and to force young men by their own will to go to the library and to look up the huge words that he would use when he came. His vocabulary was unbelievable. And of course, he wrote the great American language series, which is still a standard reference work today in the American language. But I, I wanted to comment on what the reaction of the students was. After that first visit, we looked forward to every successive year visit. And we would prepare by <clears throat> studying the topics that Mencken used to, used to really be against. He was against virtually every politician, but particularly he, his favorite subjects were Woodrow Wilson, Archangel Woodrow, William Jennings Bryan. Uh, he was against divines, uh, which is his word for religious people or pastors. He was against what he called mountebanks, quackery. Uh, he, was, he was for anything mo almost that was German, uh, especially a great admirer of Beethoven and, uh, and of, and of uh, Brahms, of course, and Wagner and what have you. Uh, he did have a good word to say about Governor Ritchie, who had been the Democratic governor of Maryland, mainly because he was against prohibition. And, and Mencken was just tremendously against prohibition. <clears throat> but he would, uh, he would so stimulate the students at, at, Ch at, at uh, Baltimore City College uh, that uh, I, I think he did more to teach us about life and about the English language and uh, than any teacher that we ever had. He was simply a great influence on my life and on the life of those of us that were privileged to be students at high school and to have him come teach our English class.
Thank you, caller. What do you take away from that? Well, that's the wonderful thing, because I think that Mencken can continue to uh, inspire students, even today. His vitality lives on, even in his writings. And so, uh, if you're not as fortunate as this caller was to have met Mencken and listened to him, I envy you. Uh, at least you can read the writings and get inspired in that way. In fact, one of the journalists, James Farrell, said that, he said that, uh, Mencken inspired journalists like himself to write with greater clarity and to be inspired to speak out courageously about matters on the day and he can do that for young journalists today as well. What was the American language? Well the American language is something that Mencken is most remembered for. It was his study of how the American language differs from the English language as he argued back in 1919 uh, the, the, the American English differs as much as the Portuguese differs from uh, Brazil to Portugal. And uh, back in 1919, uh, that was a very novel concept. And I think he instilled a wonderful pride in our American language. And it went on for volumes and volumes throughout the years. Next call from New York City. You're on C-SPAN's American Writer Series. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I knew H.L. Mencken, too. Uh, I was a medical student. Are you from Baltimore? Yeah. I was a medical student at Johns Hopkins in 1930, and I was an intern on Marburg, the private service, and Macon was a patient of mine. Uh, he was a patient of Ben Baker's, and I was the intern on the service in 1938. And I got to know Macon quite well, and he happened to be a friend of uh, another lady patient who knew him, and she said, I often have him to dinner, so next fall when, when I have him to dinner, I'll invite you out. So I got to know him that following fall and several times for rather lengthy, joyful dinners. I almost feel that, that in the time I got to know him, I almost know him as a friend. Of course, I'd read everything he ever wrote before I met him, but I want to tell you, he talked exactly as he wrote. It was just as fast, just as clever. He had an amazing response to most any subject that came up and an amazing in-depth authority. So you, you can Caller, ask, can, can you compare him in the time that you knew him uh, to anyone who is uh, either alive today or past writers? Is there another person that compares to H.L. Mencken? Well, that, that's a real good question. In today's world, uh, the closest I could come to his real subtlety of, uh, of intellect was, uh, you know, Baker, who wrote for the New York Times and, and is on public television. And, but, but Baker was so gentle. He, he, uh, he is just, Macon was, oh, they're both clever, but, uh, but Macon was, was so full of acid and he could sum somebody up I, I asked him so many questions i heard so many stories oh even about dayton you know and the monkey trials that he was so involved in and i heard him describe those early days in dayton tennessee with that unbelievable descriptive power he he told me that he went down to dayton uh, several days before the trial opened to kind of see what that town in Tennessee was like, and he found a teenage boy with a little fuzz on his cheek crying, and he went up to him and said, what's the matter? And the little boy said, my mother's going to wean me, <laughs> and Macon absolutely claimed that in this backward area of the country, of kids at eight and nine years old while at play would go over to the sidelines and pull up their mother's dress and wean themselves for a little while. His colorful descriptions of America were just endless. So, Thank you very much, caller. Thanks for the comment. Yes. 46 years after his death. 
That's right. Well, I just think it's so amazing. We've been on this show, what, just a few minutes and all these calls that are coming through with people who have had personal contact with, Me with Mencken. But I'm interested that the caller says that he was uh, working with Ben Baker because Mencken was very interested in medicine. And in fact, there are those that when they listened to him, they thought he had gone to medical school. Lawyers thought he had gone to law school. Uh, priests and rabbis thought he had uh, studied theology. I mean, this was truly a Renaissance man who was well-versed in almost every single subject. It's really quite amazing. We're going to take a walk over to the center of this Union Square Park, but we'll continue with more of the words of H.L. Mencken back from 1948. Well, of course, you'll notice the peculiar thing about the United States where there is very little free speech. Free speech is a very limited right in this country. As I have learned to my better experience more than once. Yet it is the country where the right to press opinions on reluctant hearers is carried to a development that is unheard of on earth. The whole country is full of propagandists who are bothering everybody all the time. I get in the mail every morning tremendous piles of propaganda of one kind or other. And I can easily imagine a man who would resent that, who would think it's a nuisance. And uh, he ought to have some, uh, there ought to be some way to save him from that annoyance. H.L. Mencken from 1948, Marion Elizabeth Rogers, where did he do most of his writing? Most of his writing was actually done in the house right behind us in the uh, upstairs room where some of the greatest prose of the 19th, 20th century was actually produced. We're going to continue with your calls. Bristol, Virginia, you're on C-SPAN. Yes. Uh, sort of have a question for uh, Ms. Rogers. Uh, when I was in graduate school, and this was about 20 years ago, I did some rather extensive uh, research on uh, Robert Ingley Carter, who was the second managing editor of the Baltimore Morning Herald when uh, uh, Henry Mencken was beginning his journalism career. And I got far enough along with it to learn that Carter had a tremendous uh, influence on Henry Mencken's writing and his approach to criticism. And I'm just curious if anyone, uh, uh, to Ms. Rogers' knowledge, has pursued any further research on Mr. Carter. Well... Uh, I don't know about further biographies or research on Mr. Carter, but I can say that uh, Mencken in his autobiogra autobiography does talk about his debt to Mr. Carter. And Mr. Carter had been uh, looking at Mencken's uh, drama criticism and he said, you have to give the readers a show. And uh, that's what Mencken was in some ways a showman. And uh, uh, that's that was an inspiration for him and his writing. And we're joined by Vince Fitzpatrick, who is here at Union Square. Who, who were H.L. Mencken's mentors at the time? Um, Mencken, as Marion Rogers has said, uh, used the New York Sun as a model. I think that Thomas Henry Huxley was very important as a mentor because Mencken always stressed uh, foremost clarity in prose. And many people may well disagree with what Mencken says, but very few people have any problem understanding what he says. You're a teacher, an author, and you also head up the Mencken Collection. What is that? The H.L. Mencken Collection is housed at the Enoch Pratt Free Library in downtown Baltimore. Mencken had a long and very friendly relationship with the Pratt Library. And we have at the, at the Pratt the most extensive uh, archive, Mencken archives in the world. He began to contribute material to the Pratt during the 1930s, and uh, the collection, under the very able guidance of Betty Adler, uh, has continued to grow since that time. This neighborhood, this square, was it a source of inspiration for him? It was a source of ins great inspiration for his writing. In, in my opinion, the zenith of Mencken's career artistically uh, were the day's books. Happy Days, Newspaper Days, and Heathen Days. Now, not everybody will agree with that assessment, but I think he writes beautifully. And Happy Days covers 1880 to 1892, birth to puberty, and this area where we're standing right now figured 
very prominently in some of Mencken's finest writing. We talked earlier with Marion Rogers about this neighborhood. For people who have never been to Baltimore, and as we hear some of the sirens in the background, there are two hospitals <laughs> nearby, how would you explain this area? Well, this was an area that was a, a, source, and, a source and a sustainer for Mencken. It gave him uh, the grounds for some of his finest writing. It's uh, urban America. We'll get a call from San Francisco. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I'm a younger caller. I'm 33 years old. And uh, my question is, um, why is it that H.L. Mencken says so very little uh, about the Second World War? Um, and, and what would be his, what, what was his opinion of America's transformation from uh, an isolationist nation to a uh, global superpower? Thank you very much. Vincent Patrick? A uh, very good question. Um, the first part uh, is probably more easily answered than the, uh, than the second part. Mencken, um, Mencken stepped down from the sun. He, he wrote a Monday article from 1920 to 1938. And in 1938, he took a job as an editor. So he did not have a regular forum with the Sun during the Second World War as he had previously. So that's one of the reasons why you don't see as much commentary on the war as you did on the First War, because he did not have a regular newspaper forum. Um, in terms of the second issue, uh, I guess you should start with the fact that Mencken severely distrusted Franklin Delano Roosevelt and was always distrustful of his motives. Um, I would start with that. Thank you. San Diego, you're next. Good afternoon. Hi. Uh, the prior caller kind of answered the World War II question. My other couple of questions have to do with the uh, Mencken's politics. Would he be described as a libertarian or where would he fit in on the political spectrum? And my second question has to do with after his stroke. Did he, uh, how, was his mind still completely functional, or, or what, how, how was he able to continue after his stroke? Thank you. Mary Rogers? Well, uh, if Vince would like to answer the first part, I'll take the second. Um, Mencken's politics. Mencken was, uh, I guess, best described as an old-time Jeffersonian liberal who believed that the government, the best government, governed the least. Now, whether that makes him a libertarian or not, by today's terms is a matter of debate. Uh, Mencken would line up on the liberal side today in terms of his belief in First Amendment rights. Mencken would line up on the conservative side today uh, in the fact that he did not believe, he would not believe in the continued growth of the federal government. He would not believe that the essential problems of humankind can be solved either politically or by spending money. And we'll come back to the caller's second point about H.L. Mencken after his stroke, but this is what he had to say about his views of politicians in general. Well, in politics, I'm a complete neutral. I think they're all scoundrels without exception. There are, especially that is true, of the reformers. I've known uh, politicians by the thousand all my life, and I'm here to tell you that the most pleasant men and on the whole, the most honest of them are what are ordinarily looked on as machine politicians. And Marion Rogers, the caller had also asked about H.L. Mencken when he had a stroke. Yes. It was here at 1524 Holland Street, and then he died, what, six or seven years later? Well, he died seven years later. The stroke uh, affected his brain in that he had asphasia, so he had difficulty speaking at first, although as the years went on, it was, people found it easier to understand what he was saying. But the horrible thing, the horrible tragedy of Mencken's life is that he was unable to read or write. He was a man who made his living reading and writing, and he would look at the shelves of his books and he would say, oh, if only I could read again. That was his constant lament, and for seven long years he was unable to do that. And we will come back to this later in the program, Vince Fitzpatrick, but as you look at that third floor where he passed away, 1956, 1955? Mencken died uh, in the early morning hours, Sunday morning, January 29th, 1956, and he passed away in the third floor bank, which was his bedroom. Baron Rogers, we're going to rejoin you in just a couple of minutes as we continue to walk down this inner city park and take a look at... Uh, a fountain directly in front of us, which represents what? 
Well, it's the Mencken Memorial Fountain, which was dedicated in 1971. And as we'll be able to see when we get down there, they have a number of plaques which represent uh, Mencken's various books. And the fountain is important because it's a testament to Mencken's productivity and great achievement. But it's also very important because it places Mencken in this milieu, which is extremely important. Mencken is associated with Baltimore in particular and 1524 Holland Street, Union Square, uh, Baltimore in general, and 1524 Holland Street and Union Square in particular, as much as, say, uh, Perot is associated with Walden Pond, as much as uh, Mark Twain is associated with Hannibal and the Mississippi River, as much as Faulkner is associated with Oxford, Mississippi, and the fictional Yoke of Atolfo County. Uh, I'd like to point out two additional things in terms of the uh, acknowledgement of Mencken's reputation and the keeping of the flame. One of these plaques to my left is dedicated to Betty Adler, who was the Mencken bibliographer, and she was my successor, my predecessor at the Pratt Library as the curator of the Mencken collection. And every person who has written about Mencken is very much in her debt. She died in 1973, and three years later, in 1976, the Mencken Society was founded, and that has done very much to keep Mencken's flame burning quite brightly. I want to point out, this is the date that the fountain was dedicated, September 12, 1971. It was called Defender's Day. That was the day that he was born. What's the significance of that date in the life of H.L. Mencken, besides the fact that he was born on that date in history? That was uh, pertained to the Battle of North Point, if I'm, return if I'm remembering my local history correctly, I believe. Here in Baltimore. Yes. And there are a couple of books that are depicted here along the fountain. Again, this was dedicated in 1971. One called Dam, a Book of Calumny. What is that all about? Dam, a Book of Calumny was one of Mencken's relatively early books. Uh, it was um, originally published by Philip Goodman and was later reissued by Alfred A. Knopf. And as the title suggests, it shows Mencken the iconoclast. There are a series of brief essays about a variety of topics. See, begins with an essay called Pater Patrie about George Washington and how George Washington would not fit in well with contemporary American society. Another book, In Defense of Women, mm -hmm. we move down to the fountain. In Defense of Women uh, was published in 1918, uh, again, originally by Philip Goodman, and it was later reissued by Alfred A. Knopf. It's one of Mencken's most, uh, most vibrant volumes. It continues to this day to delight some and outrage others. Rather than accuse or complain, Mencken laughs very loudly at the grotesquely humorous efforts of men and women to deal with one another. And one of his more famous works, The American Language, which is the basis in part of this American Writer series. The American Language, Mencken uh, first began to write on philology in 1910 in a newspaper column, and he continued to write up until his stroke in 1948. And the American language ran to four, four uh, different editions and two supplements, so six books in all. For me, Mencken's greatest achievement in the American language is the fact that he can make this topic accessible to the common reader and still make it informative to the scholar. From that 1948 interview, Donald Kirkley asked H.L. Mencken about the American language, which, uh, as we just heard from Vince Fitzpatrick, came out in four volumes. Here's what he had to say about it. It wasn't a transition. I never, never have been a scholar and never pretended to be one. My interest in American speech began in my young repertorial days. I'd listened to the testimony in police courts, and it was a level of society that was unfamiliar to me, and I was fascinated by it, and the talk of policemen and so on. And I began making notes about it and wrote a couple of newspaper pieces about it, and uh, I found that a lot of other people were interested, and they began writing to me, and I accumulated material, and finally the thought occurred to me that it would make a book. And I wrote the book, and uh, both my publisher and I believed that it had a rather limited appeal. We printed it in a limited edition, and the edition was sold out 
That was the American language. First edition, 19, 1918 or 19. It sold out so fast. And once it got out, the amount of material came pouring in so enormously that uh, I, I was just forced to write another edition, and then another, and then another. And then it got so enormous that I had to write appendixes. Uh, but I never pretended to be a scholar. I was a sort of scout for scholars. I accumulated the material and tried to put it into a readable form so that people could understand it and to suck out of it whatever human juices were there, and there were plenty. H.L. Mencken on his book, The American Language. We are coming to you from the center of Union Square in Baltimore. Our next call is Rockford, Illinois. Good afternoon. Yeah, good afternoon. I was uh, watching a book note a replay yesterday about an interview on Mencken's diaries. And, and I wondered, uh, either for Mr. Fitzpatrick or uh, for Miss Rogers when she comes back, how how they feel about the, the claims that he was anti-Semitic and, and racist. I I feel he's kind of being unfairly judged by by some hypocritical standards, and I just wondered uh, how Miss Rogers is handling in her biography and, and what Mr. Fitzpatrick's thoughts are on it. Uh, Miss Rogers' book was the first book I purchased on Mencken, her, her volume, The Impossible Mencken, about 10 years ago, and I really expected to to see some dowdy old scholar, and I was surprised to see a, a pretty young lady, and, and I wondered what she's what she thinks about the whole anti-Semitic uh, racist claims. That's all. Thank you. Marion Rogers, do you want to go through the chronology of H.L. Mencken's thinking from the 1920s to the 1930s into the start of World War II? Uh, yes. Uh, well, the, Mencken's, the chronology of Mencken's thinking was uh, that he was always uh, fighting for the uh, civil rights of, of various individuals, African Americans, many, many others. But the, the fact is, is that when it comes to the diary, I think Jonathan Yardley said it best. We should uh, put Mencken uh, in his time and place. Mencken was not considered bigoted or anti-Semitic during those years that he lived. Uh, now we're all very, very careful, and so some of the things that he said strike us in the wrong way. But, uh, but he, he, I think it's very, very important, and what I am doing in my own biography is I'm not being an apologist for Mencken, but I am putting him in the context of his time and place. And we'll come back to that later in the program. Charlotte, North Carolina, you're next. Yes, my question is for uh, Miss Rogers or Mr. Fitzpatrick. I know that William Manchester, who is the biographer of Churchill and also did a number of works on John Kennedy, became the assistant to Mencken after his stroke. It seems like his viewpoints are completely different than a lot of Mencken's. I was just wondering if the two of them might be able to shed some light on the relationship. Thank you. Vince Fitzpatrick? Well, William Manchester wrote a, a very fine biography of Mencken that came out in uh, 1950. Uh, two, two biographies came out that year, one by Edgar Kemmler and one by uh, Manchester, both uh, sympathetic analyses which present Mencken uh, from a different perspective. Manchester came to know Mencken uh, very well during those final years after the stroke and spent time with him here at 1524 Holland Street. Let me ask you about one other book that is listed here, The Prejudices. What was that? What did he write about? The Prejudices, uh, as the title suggests, uh, present Mencken's views, Mencken's biases. Uh, the Prejudices gave him the space to frolic as he pleased, to shock and embellish and, and sigh. And the series ran, it was a multi-volume series, it ran to six volumes between 1919 and 1927 and there was the selected prejudices which continued, uh, which, which appeared that same year. And we'll continue with your calls. Good afternoon. Hello, you're on C-SPAN's American Writer Series. Go ahead, please. Hello? Call, are you with us? Portland, Connecticut, go ahead. Ah, yes, that is me. <laughs> I was a bit distracted. I have uh, two questions, actually. One from Ms. Rogers, which is what attracted her to Mencken as a subject uh, to begin with, and speaking of Mr. Manchester, he once told me 
uh, that Mencken would not be able to find a forum in a single major newspaper in this country nowadays, and I would like your thoughts and reflections on that. Thank you. Marion Rogers, how would, you, how would you respond to that? Uh, well, I, I, I'll answer the first part of the question, and that is uh, uh, I came to Mencken uh, when I was uh, a student at Goucher College. I, it was, the year was 1981. I was a senior, and I was working in the rare book room uh, writing an article about Sarah Hart, who was a student at Goucher at the time, and I actually tripped over a, a box of of letters between Mencken and Sarah inside there were 750 love letters and taped to the top of the box was a notice by Mencken it said do not open until 1981 signed H.L. Mencken and uh, the year was 1981 it was two weeks from my graduation so it's what some biographers speak of uh, that uh, these acts of serendipity that you don't find your subject your subject finds you and that little act of clutchiness actually changed my whole life. Uh, as for Mencken find, finding a forum today, well, it would be a lively column, wouldn't it? Uh, and I, I think that uh, we need people who to come down strong on different subject matters. Sometimes I do think that columnists are a little too careful, and uh, someone like Mencken would be quite refreshing. San Rafael, California, you're next. Uh, I have here a letter from H.L. Mencken in response to questions about his uh, attitude towards World War II. The letter is addressed to a Judge Max, and it has no address. But he states in it, this is dated February 4th, 1946, and Mr. Mencken says that my belief is that the United States is already over Niagara, and that all talk of saving it is in vain. We are, in fact, in for some labor troubles that will be enormously worse than any we have ever seen. Moreover, I'm convinced that there will be some kind of inflation. I hope I'm wrong, but it seems to me that a country idiotic enough to turn the Russian barbarians into Western Europe and to destroy Japan's effort to organize and civilize the Far East deserves any fate that our Heavenly Father may dish out to it. <laughs> that's, that's all he has to say in this letter. And I just thought it would be interesting uh, to answer their comments about how did he feel about World War II. Thank you, caller. I, I appreciate the caller sharing that. Yes, uh, it was a situation with Mencken, as I said before, where he did not have the regular journalistic forum, so you had uh, you didn't have the commentary in print. And as I said before, he was very suspicious of uh, FDR's motives. We're joined here by Vince Fitzpatrick, who heads up the Mencken Collection. He's also a teacher here in the Baltimore area, and he'll be joining us during the course of the program. And Marion Rogers, who is coming out with a new biography on H.L. Mencken within the next year. We'll get a call from Tucson, Arizona. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Just wanted to say I love your show. I'm glad you're on the air, and thanks for taking my call. Uh, my uh, comments are twofold. first one is, uh, as a capital L libertarian myself, I would put Mencken strongly in the capital L libertarian camp. Uh, from everything I've read by Mencken, uh, he was foursquare against big government, both on economic and social issues, uh, which would make him a libertarian in my book. Second, as far as a, um, any contemporary journalist that might compare favorably with Mencken, uh, I would put Christopher Hitchens in that category. Um, both of them have been ag are agnostics. Um, both of them were Renaissance men, to use uh, a phrase used earlier. And Hitchens, in particular, was a not afraid in Vanity Fair and other places to uh, take on such icons as Princess Diana and Mother Teresa. So um, he's the only one I can think of who might match Mencken as far as uh, taking on uh, <laughs> shining lights in the mass media. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Vince says, Patrick, can you define his ideology and put a label either libertarian or conservative or moderate or liberal to, to his writings? Well, as I had suggested, I think that the, the bedrock of Mencken's uh, politics was his uh, Jeffersonian liberalism, his belief that the best government is leaves the individual alone as much as possible. Uh, as I've said, he would line up on today's left in terms of issues such as First Amendment rights. He would line up on today's right in terms of such issues as uh, the role of the federal government in terms of economic and political issues. So uh, it depends on how the term is used. 
We are at Union Square on Holland Street, and we're looking at the life and works of H.L. Mencken, who lived here most of his life, about a mile and a half from downtown Baltimore. We'll be joined in just uh, another 20 minutes or so. Back with you, Vince Fitzpatrick. Thank you very much for Thank being you. with us. Thank you. P.J. O'Rourke is a uh, Mencken aficionado, has studied him, and has his own thoughts about the life and works of Mr. Mencken. It's very hard to put a finger on what Mencken was politically. No. I think the political conservatives, such as the old American Spectator crowd, who, who laid claim to Mencken, uh, uh, made themselves out to be sort of the modern heirs to, to Mencken's sensibility, would have been cr quite wrong. Uh, he was conservative in one sense, that he disliked change and was suspicious of change, and he was suspicious of a bogus populism. But you have to remember that he came out of an era of bogus populism. It was very much the rage from the time that he was a young man through, really through the, uh, through Roosevelt, whom he detested, uh, 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 Franklin. Uh, I'm not thinking he was a big, he wasn't a big fan of Teddy either, but I mean, he really detested uh, Franklin. There was this strain of bogus populism in um, uh, American politics uh, that uh, uh, everything from a desire to inflate the money to f trying to fix railroad rates to uh, all the New Deal programs uh, and even the relatively conservative Republican uh, era um, uh, after World War I was marked with maybe the exception of the Coolidge administration and Mencken didn't like Coolidge either. Mencken never liked him didn't like politics, was suspicious of politics. Conservatives can't, conservatives do like politics. Uh, they just wish they won more often, you know. They, 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 but was Mencken a libertarian? In a small L sense, he certainly was for letting anybody do whatever they wanted as long as it didn't harm others, I, I, I think. But, but to call him a libertarian would, um, would mean that Mencken had a, strong belief in the sanctity of the individual, the, the, the primacy of the individual, the idea that society and political uh, organization should be based on the individual. And I don't think Mencken's opinion of the individual was quite that high. Uh, Mencken was a believer, as many people in his era were, of, in the forces of culture. Uh, he believed, he may not have believed in, 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 in politics, he may not even have been much of a nationalist, but he did believe in culture. The thoughts of P.J. O'Rourke, and we are coming to you live from Union Square in Baltimore, Maryland, where H.L. Mencken lived and worked and wrote and where he got many of his ideas. We're joined again by Marion Rogers. The writers of his time, Theodore Dreiser, Sinclair Lewis, Ernest Hemingway, how was Mencken viewed and how did he view those writers and others? Well, uh, before we do that, I just wanted to, to pop in something else, if you don't mind, Steve, and to say that Mencken actually was very much for the individual man. In fact, uh, he, he was the type of writer who hated the mob but was for the individual. And now to uh, answer, answer your, I'm just going back to something P.J. O'Rourke said, but uh, to go back to your question, uh, Mencken was really the pioneer of literary critics. He, he helped all the writers that we continue to, to study today. So he was the first to publish James Joyce in this country. He uh, helped the work of F. Scott Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald looked to Mencken for an inspiration, and so did Sinclair Lewis. Many of the books that we study about with Sinclair Lewis uh, were taken from ideas and conversations that he had with Mencken. Theodore Dreiser was another uh, writer that Mencken championed. It, when Dreiser's work were, were being censored, it was Mencken who was beating the drum always to promote Dreiser. So uh, people need to remember that uh, th this is one of the great uh, importances of Mencken very quickly go through his life. He came here at the age of three. He lived here all but five years during his married life. What did he do when he first began his career as a reporter? 
Well, when he first c covered his career as a reporter, he was really covering the police courts and different aspects of the city. His stories were quite good for the time. I mean, he was 18 years old, uh, but uh, Mencken always said that if he looked back and, and uh, looked at them today, he would shudder. Uh, but he really began his uh, his uh, more his national prominence with an, with a, a, a stream of columns called the Freelance, which was taking place in the early teens of the 1900s, and this is where he gained his local prominence. His national prominence really happened with the Monday column, which he wrote for the Baltimore Evening Sun, and then we go on with all the other books that he wrote, but it was really this newspaper column, the Monday column, that, although it wasn't syndicated, really got him into the national forefront. You can follow along on this series by logging onto our website, AmericanWriters.org. This is a second uh, of a series of installments as we look at the life and works of H.L. Mencken and continue through the 20th century. That's AmericanWriters.org or on our website at cspan.org. Gilman, Illinois, you're next. Go ahead, please. Well, my name is Carolyn Daly, and back in May 1980, and I helped get funding for a H.L. Minkin International Conference at Chicago's Newberry Library, um, and uh, as a result of that, I had a friendship ever since then with a Doug Stenerson, who was then a professor of uh, American literature at Chicago's Roosevelt University, who's now in his early 80s and in very poor health, but uh, he was especially interested, as you mentioned a while ago, about Minkin's uh, friendship with Reiser, and I know that I've read several books of volumes of letters of Minkin's correspondence with Reiser and others, and uh, that he and Reiser, I guess they stopped being really good friends when um, when Minkin's mother died, and he'd been very close to her, and Reiser didn't, you know, write the condolence letter or something that Minkin had expected, and so they didn't have much to do with each other after that. So that is pretty much a call because I wanted to sort of get Doug Stenerson's uh, name into the record. He wrote at least four scholarly volumes on Minkin, I think, one of them which was done as recently as about 1990. Thank you, caller. We are in Union Square Park, and directly across the street is Holland Street. 1524 is where Vince Fitzpatrick has now moved to. The relationship between Mr. Minkin and Mr. Dreiser, do you want to explain that? Yes, uh, let me pick up on uh, what the previous caller said. Uh, Professor Douglas Tennyson has done some wonderful writing on Mencken, and uh, he has a book on Mencken, and he also was the editor of Critical Essays on H.L. Mencken, a fine volume, and he very kindly asked me to contribute to that, and it was a great honor. In terms of the Dreiser Mencken letters, uh, they were superbly edited by Professor Thomas Riggio of the University of Connecticut. And a number of people, myself included, have written on the relationship between Mencken and Theodore Dreiser. It was the most important literary relationship in each man's career. Had they not met, each man's career might well have been different. So might the course of American letters during the 20th century. I believe that the Mencken-Dreiser relationship proves as significant as, say, the relationship between Emerson and Thoreau and the relationship between uh, Mark Twain and William Dean Hales. Our next call is Hot Springs, Arkansas. Go ahead, please. Oh, thanks for saying. Um, Marion, I was uh, just, I, I read his diaries and I've read some of his books, uh, editors, editor's Days, and, and, and some biographies. And it seemed like uh, Minkin was conscious of religion and he was conscious of race and mannerisms and characteristics and but I don't think it made him a bigot in any way because if you look at his actions, his the, the people that worked for him, you know, his domestics, he paid them well. He he had good relationships with a lot of the, uh, the Jewish people, with Kanaf, a, a lot of editors. He had a lot of friends from everywhere. And and if I'm not mistaken, I think that he even uh, contributed to the um, Harlem Renaissance a little bit by introducing some authors to Kanaf. And I was just yes. kind of wanting your ideas, you know, what you thought. Yes, you're absolutely right, and I appreciate your bringing this up. When Mencken was the editor of the American Language, he was one of the first white editors to ever publish African authors, African American authors, in his magazine. And he published Langston Hughes and W.E.B. Du Bois and George Schuyler and many, many others. 
Also, Mencken uh, really took, his, uh, took a great risk when he wrote against a lynching that took place on Baltimore on the eastern shore of Maryland during uh, the 1930s. And uh, the Nation magazine later awarded him a prize for courage. I mean, there were people who were saying that if he set foot on the eastern shore, he would be lynched himself. His articles condemning that lynching were so strong and so original, because not many people were writing against it, that uh, Baltimore goods were boycotted, including the Baltimore Sun, by the entire eastern shore. So Mencken was very cur courageous in this kind of thing. In just a moment, we're going to take you inside the Baltimore Row House. It was H.L. Macon's home most of his life. But we'll get a call first from Denver. Go ahead, please. Well, I just wanted to get a call in to you about how funny the man was. He seems kind of lugubrious when you talk about his iconoclasm and what all of it. And I'd like to congratulate you on getting, by the way, P.J. O'Rourke on your program. I've had the pleasure of meeting Mr. O'Rourke a couple of times, and he's right in line of the legacy number one position of Mencken himself. But Mencken was a funny writer, and he, he used to laugh out loud, as I understand it, when he typed out his work on his typewriter, <laughs> using his elbow, I think, to get the return carriage to go back. And I love that. But I did have a funny thing that's ingrained in my memory for just about forever. And he said the words to the effect that if the right kind of pressure could be brought upon any elected public official, he would come out cheerfully in favor of bigamy, astrology, and cannibalism. <laughs> Yeah, Mencken had some funny quotes. One of my favorites is the, his, his, uh, his quote on Puritanism, which he said, it's the haunting fear that someone somewhere may be happy. And uh, there's another one about bachelors. Bachelors know more about women than married men. If not, they'd be married too. He has these wonderful one-liners, and the caller's absolutely right. Uh, reporters peeping in would find uh, Mencken writing in his hotel room during a convention and actually laughing at his own prose. Was he a drinker? Oh yes, Mencken absolutely adored beer and in fact uh, and all kinds of drinks. He called himself ambibulous. But uh, during prohibition times uh, all of this area of Holland Street you could smell the smell of hops in the air on Sundays. People were either brewing baths of gin or bottling beer. And uh, there we have on, the, on your screen, we have a picture of Mencken during the reappeal of Prohibition in 1933. The official repeal of Prohibition, of course, was not until December, but in April, Roosevelt uh, fulfilled a campaign promise to bring back beer. And Mencken, who had written against Prohibition, he thought that it was not only against a man's civil liberties, but it also corrupted the courts and, and uh, produced a lot of harassment uh, to people by uh, the, the federal bureaucracy. He took great pride. He was invited to the Rennert that evening in 1933. He was going to be given the very first glass of the brew as it was poured on 12 midnight that evening. There were hundreds of people in that room. I spoke to a, a student from Johns Hopkins University and he said he went there just to see history being made. And uh, when that first frothy glass appeared uh, at midnight, Mencken lifted it up, took one long beautiful gulp and everyone leaned forward. They wanted to know what was his verdict and he said, not bad at all. Fill it again. And it was a marvelous evening for those who were there. And 16 years after Prohibition came to an end, this is what H.L. Mencken said about it. I'm uh, actually ambibulous. I drink every known alcohol drink. What was that word? Ambibulous. That's a very fine word. I drink every known alcoholic drink and enjoy them all. And... Uh, I've always learnt early in life how to handle alcohol and never had any trouble with it. The rules are as simple as mud. First, never drink if you've got any work to do. Never. If I've got a job of work to do at 10 o'clock at night, I wouldn't take a drink up to that time. Uh, secondly, never drink alone. That's the way to become a drunkard. And thirdly, even if you haven't got any work to do, never drink while the sun is shining. 
wait until it's dark. Uh, by that time, you're near enough to bed to recover quickly. And back to your calls, Costa Mesa, California. You're next on C-SPAN's American Writer Series. Oh, thank you. I think this is a great show about a very great American. Uh, I'd like the guests to uh, tell the story of Mencken's history of the bathtub by which he tweaked the noses of editors and readers all over the United States. And I'd also like to hear some commentary about Nathan's, I'm sorry, Mencken's partnership with George G. Nathan. And thank you very much for taking my call. Goodbye. Thank you, caller. Marion Rogers? Yes, the bathtub hoax is very famous. In fact, it, uh, it still goes on to this day. Uh, and that was, Mencken wrote the facetious history of the bathtub, and uh, even uh, wrote about how the first bathtub was installed in the White House and so on. And he was writing it uh, during the time of uh, World War I. Um, it was really a spoof. But people took it quite literally, and uh, he was quite gratified uh, back in the in the 40s that when uh, President Truman, a president that Mencken did not particularly admire, was giving a tour in the White House and giving the entire history of the bathtub, which was really Mencken's own uh, own prose. Uh, as for his uh, friendship with George G. Nathan, Mencken and Nathan met uh, during the 1900s and they co-edited co the smart set together. George G. Nathan is still considered one of the deans of American theater critics and did a lot to influence uh, the American stage. And they had wonderful years together, perhaps their happiest time together were during those years of the smart set. Then they later went on to edit the American Mercury together. They had a falling out at that time although uh, neither would ever admit it publicly. And then they were reunited again later in their lives uh, during the late 1940s. Aaron Rogers, we're gonna go inside 1524 Holland Wonderful. Street and give our audience a sense of what it looks like. Again, just to remind our audience that he died in 1956. Yes. What happened afterwards? Well, afterwards, this row house was in, in the ownership of August Mencken, that was Mencken's uh, younger brother. And then the house uh, was then later bequeathed to the University of Maryland. Then it went on to the city. It became the Mencken House Museum. And when the City Life Museums went uh, under here in Baltimore, the house uh, remained empty. It's empty now, which is a great shame because unlike many writers' homes, this house has almost all of the furniture and books and stuff of Mencken's and which is now in storage but here you can see uh, I believe that's the uh, front parlor which would, would, would have been considered the uh, formal social room of the house uh, this is where he had the piano this is a typical house of a, of a middle-class family uh, in the 19th century uh, there you have Mencken uh, playing the piano the other room that is connected to the front parlor would be the uh, informal sitting room. This is where Mencken spent some of his uh, happiest times. It was in these rooms that Mencken was uh, meeting with the lawyers for John Scopes to, to uh, help the Scopes monkey trial. It was one on one of these far walls was a cabinet full of books and where Mencken discovered the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. He also had a uh, cabinet filled with beer steins there. The thing is about this house is that Mencken kept saying over and over again to his brother August, you know, I really worry about the fate of this house. I'm afraid that one day it's going to be empty and abandoned and it's going to be a wreck. And uh, right now it's, it's not a, quite a wreck, but uh, there uh, is a very passionate and determined band of citizens who don't want to see it become that way and uh, they call themselves the friends of the Mencken house and I just want to go back here we're now in the dining room that is uh, the wallpaper you see there is uh, very close to the original wallpaper that was there in the window the little pony Frank used to st stick his head through the window and, and slurp up homemade ice cream but going back to the friends of the Mencken house 
there are many people who are also supporting the, the friends to see this house going back to being a living, a breathing museum that would have partnerships with school programs and universities so that this becomes a, a, a museum that helps the community. And among those who are supporting the Friends include David McCullough, William Styron, uh, William Manchester, Russell Baker, the actress Susan Sarandon, and many, many others. And I believe you have a website that we can post on the screen and also an address that you can write to so that the Friends can open up this house and all of you can come back and visit it and see and experience Mencken's legacy. We're at the corner of Hollins and Gilmore in downtown Baltimore, about a mile and a half from Center City, just off the Martin Luther King Boulevard, if you're familiar with uh, the Baltimore area. We're going to take you upstairs, and as we do so, we'll get a call from Medford, Massachusetts. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Rogers, oh, what do you see as the influence, if any, on H.L. Mencken of uh, an earlier and uh, somewhat similar figure on the American scene, uh, the great infidel uh, Robert uh, Ingersoll? who was probably as well known in, in his own time uh, for similar reasons of outspokenness, shall we say, uh, as he is forgotten today. Thank you. Yes, well, offhand, uh, I, I can't give you a direct quote of what he thought of, of Ingersoll, but, uh, but absolutely, uh, Mencken was, was very, very important in... Uh, in, in influencing others and w one of the things he was he, he loved reading the congressional record he loved uh, telling reporters to to go and and read that and you'll get ideas for stories you'll 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 actually be able to read the american language that is spoken by politicians you'll be able to really learn what's going on in the world and uh, this is a, a, a hint that Izzy Stone later, another one who I guess is a little forgotten today, but Izzy Stone who also read the congressional record and used it as a springboard for his prose. He's home a four-story row house in the center of Holland Street. What was on the second floor? On the second floor was his mother's sitting room that after her death in 1925 became Mencken's office and this is where he he wrote some of his uh, his prose and his articles you also had uh, other bedrooms there and then you go on and you can see it right here on your screen uh, this is this is the, the what was Mencken's office probably one of the most important rooms in the house other than the garden uh, the room that meant the most to Mencken here he is upstairs also in one of the studies that was used before his mother's death. This is the third floor back study where he wrote the first edition of the American language in 1919. Our next call from San Diego. Good afternoon. Yeah, hi. A couple of questions. Uh, number one, uh, was Mencken critical of Adolf Hitler from the beginning or did, his pos uh, did he evolve on that position? Number two, the Scopes trial. How long was Mencken in Dayton, Tennessee? And uh, did he get along with Clarence Darrow, and was he part of the uh, defense strategy? And uh, the Gene Kelly portrayal in Inherit the Wind, was that an accurate the representation? Thank you. Thank you, caller. First of all, what was the Scopes trial? The Scopes trial was one of the first uh, media events of the 1920s. It was called a trial of the century. We've had many trials of the century since then, but the fact is, is in July of 1925, John Scopes was a school teacher in Dayton, Tennessee, and he was arrested for teaching Darwin's theory of evolution in class at the time that was against Tennessee law. And Mencken was the one who convinced Clarence Darrow, who was the famous lawyer of his day, to go down to Dayton and uh, defend John Scopes. Some of the preliminary uh, ideas for the defense were discussed right here on Holland Street in his house with Arthur Garfield Hayes, who was also a very famous lawyer with the uh, ACLU, who was part of the defense team of John Scopes. Uh, so that was a wonderful trial. Mencken wrote uh, wonderful uh, articles that were quoted throughout the country and uh, during the Scopes trial. Uh, what was the other question of your caller you had? Uh... Let me read one part of what he said oh, yes, in describing Dayton, Tennessee. Uh -huh. He said, I expected to find a squalid southern village with darkies 
snoozing on the horse blocks, what I found was a country town full of charm and even beauty. Yes, um, not many of the people in Dayton liked Mencken because uh, he he wrote about them in, in, such a, in such a cynical way. But actually, as for the town itself, Mencken was quite enraptured with it. He thought it looked like a, a town in Westminster, Maryland, in fact. And so, uh, and he stayed at the home of a dentist out there in Dayton, and, uh, and uh, the, the two of them corresponded, in fact, for many years after the Scopes trial had actually died down. And this is what H.L. Mencken had to say about that trial from July 1925. The audio comes from an interview that he did in 1948. I remember, for instance, the Scopes trial. Oh, that was a lot of fun. Oh, it was a lot of fun. With an, o with an overtone of tragedy, don't you think? Yes, it was, it was a dreadful thing to think of presumably civilized people falling into such a slough. And it was a dreadful thing to look at a man like Brian, a man with his opportunities in the world, to see what he had come to intellectually in his old age. It was a tragedy in a way, but I should add at once, it wasn't a tragedy to me. I wasn't uh, suffering anything. I was enjoying it. Marion Rogers, the trial was 1925. Five years later, he marries his wife, Sarah in 1930 and they were married for how long? They were married for five years. Uh, the sad thing about their marriage is although it was a very happy marriage, uh, Sarah had always suffered from tuberculosis and so uh, their, their marriage was tinged by illness. Um, Mencken took her on various sea voyages for her health. Even during those depression times, he was financially uh, comfortable enough to pay for the many doctors and nurses that were constantly in the house. And uh, when she died, uh, Mencken said quite sadly, uh, the doctors predicted that she had only three years to live, but actually she lived five. So I had two more years of happiness than I had any right to expect. And Vince Fitzpatrick, who is across the street on Holland Street, it was 21 years later when H.L. Mencken passed away in 1946. And he was taken to a funeral home, what, three or four homes down from where he lived? Yes, uh, I'm walking up toward that now. Mencken was taken to the Whitsky Funeral Home on the corner of Hollands and Gilmore Street. Mencken died in the early hours of Sunday, January 29th, 1956. And there was a brief service held here on Tuesday, uh, January 31st, 1956. Mencken had, had not wished for anything large, so it was a small ceremony. The family was here, uh, a, as well as a small group of friends. Alfred A. Knopf came, the novelist James M. Kane. Some of the Sun Papers people were here, his close friend, Dr. Louis Cheslock, and Hamilton Owens, his editor at the Evening Sun, said a few words and after which time Mencken's body was, was taken from the house and cremated. And his ashes were placed in the family plot in the Loudon Park Cemetery. It's uh, several mile, miles southwest of here, down the road from the old St. Mary's Industrial School that educated Babe Ruth, another Baltimorean who had enthralled America during a better day. Mencken had chosen his elegy. Mencken had written his elegy long before it had appeared in the December 1921 Smart Set. This was during the tenure of President Warren G. Harding. Much had changed since that time. Mencken's reputation had risen, plummeted, and then ascended once more. But Mencken, thankfully, found no reason to revise what he had written years before. Why did he decide to spend his entire life in Baltimore? Well, he, uh, he found Baltimore congenial in a number of ways. It was congenial because he had family here, he had friends here, he enjoyed the ambiance of the city, the place of the city, and I guess as important as anything else, the city was very congenial with his writing schedule, and he found it an easy place to get work done. When he passed away, any regrets about his life? No, Mencken had no regrets. Mencken had lived fully. If there was only one regret, it would have been that he could have stayed productive up until the uh, time of his death. The years after the stroke were very difficult for him because 
He, uh, he couldn't read and write, as we said, but he was a man who had a great gusto. He lived fully every day, and that gusto, that vitality is evident in, in his prose. Before we let you go, Vince Fitzpatrick, is there a line or a, a graph from all that he has written that stands out in your mind? Yes, the thing I'd like to point to is, uh, is the epigraph. As I said, he'd written it in uh, December 1921, and uh, he never saw reason to change it. And he spoke uh, in an unusually quiet voice, a voice that's very different from some of the public writing where Mencken was writing at the top of his lungs. In an unusually quiet voice, he asked for tolerance. If after I depart this veil, you ever remember me and have thought to please my ghost, forgive some sinner and wink your eye at some homely girl. Vince Fitzpatrick, who is the curator of the Mencken Collection, he's also a teacher here in the Baltimore area at Loyola Blakefield School and University of Maryland Baltimore campus. What else are you working on? Thank you very much. Uh, I, have a, I had the good fortune to have the opportunity to write a biography of Gerald W. Johnson, who knew Mencken very well. It's called uh, Gerald W. Johnson from uh, Southern Liberal to National Conscience, and it will be published this June by the Louisiana State University Press. My 1989 biography of Mencken is currently being considered for republication in paperback. And my wife, Carol, and I, and uh, our colleague, Professor Mary Beth Rushika of St. John's University in Queens, New York, are currently working on the fifth edition of a textbook, the Complete Sentence Workout Book, to be published by Longman. Thank you. Vince Fitzpatrick, who is the curator of the H.L. Mencken Collection, joining us from On Holland Street, just across from Union Square. Thank you. Thank you. And back to your call. San Francisco, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm enjoying the program, particularly Miss Rogers' description of Mencken's views on drinking, because I was the author of a little book called The Ambibulous Mr. Mencken, described as a humorous drinking biography of H.L. Mencken. Many of the pictures you've used are in that book, and I'm delighted that the friends of the H.L. Mencken House are using copies of the book as premiums to donors to save the house. Really enjoying the program. I'm a big fan of your book, and uh, I just wanted to give viewers that address. I don't know if you have it up there on your screen, but if you're interested in saving Mencken's house and want to come to Baltimore and see it, please write to Friends of the Mencken House, they're at 733 Martin Drive, Catonsville, Maryland, 21229-1116. Or you can call 410-947-7351. Or if you are computer literate, you can go to the website, and it's www.mankenhouse.org. I had to give that plug in. I just hope you and you'll join David McCullough and William Styron and so many others to help save this house. This book, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary of American Writers, is our companion to the American Writers series. You can get it from our website at AmericanWriters.org. We also encourage educators and teachers to log on and learn more about the lesson plan that's available from this website. Next call from Edinburgh, Texas. Good afternoon. Well, good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, a wonderful program. Uh, due to Minkin's agnosticism, I'm curious as to what uh, the his thought of his uh, what would it be his how would he conjecture dealing with the irony of the Middle East quandary in religion dealing with between the Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Uh, thank you very much. I will hang up and listen to your answer. Yes, well, Mencken actually visited Israel in 1934 and wrote an article for the Baltimore Evening Sun called Eretz Israel, which was later actually put out in book form. And it's quite haunting, really, to go back and read what he has to say, because back then uh, Palestine uh, was just beginning to exist, and he said, one day these fields are going to be run over with blood as red as this earth itself. And uh, if you go back and, and look at that particular article, or if you can find that book, which is now a collector's item, uh, it's, it's, it's quite haunting, really. Tella Rosa, New Mexico, you're next. Yes, howdy. Uh, this is um, a comment about uh, the followers, as it were, of H.L. Uh, Mencken. Uh, it seems that they are 
not in newspapers as much as they are in television or radio, such as uh, Lenny Bruce or Howard Stern, and especially Bill Maher in Politically Incorrect. Could you uh, discuss that, please? Thank you. That, let me see if I understand you right, that, his, that you are calling the, these people they're his followers that are on TV. Oh, well, I, Bill Maher, I know, is a big fan of uh, Mencken and has quoted him from time to time. Uh, and uh, I, think, I think there's room for, for all kinds of, of people, and if they want to be as outrageous and as controversial as they like, uh, more power to them. Next call, Alexandria, Virginia. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. A couple of questions have been dodged, I thought. Uh, his attitude toward Germany in the two wars and his attitude uh, toward anti-Semitism or racism uh, that would be considered politically incorrect uh, today. Uh, we want the full picture. Uh, give, us it, give it to us straight. Uh, I hope uh, C-SPAN isn't being affected by political correctness. Thank you. Yes, actually, a caller had uh, had asked this earlier during the Scopes trial question, so I'm glad we've come back to that. Uh, during World War II, uh, Mencken actually was very dismayed about Hitler because he said that he was a clown and that he was uh, ruining any any thought of Germany that German Americans like himself or others had. In fact, I'd like to read you a letter that Mencken wrote to to a correspondent during this this time period and very briefly he says uh, I should add that I'm entirely out of sympathy with the method used by Hitler to handle the Jewish question now this was in 1936 mind you before the any word of the Holocaust but he goes on it seems to me that the gross brutality to harmless individuals must needs revolt every decent man I am well aware that reports from Germany have been exaggerated again this is 1936 but I'm also well aware that intolerable brutalities have been practiced I don't know a single man of any reputation in America who's in favor of the Nazi scheme as it stands Germany has completely lost the sympathy it had during the years following 1920 now, Mencken did visit Germany in 1938, and uh, he, he did take a sense of pride in seeing how Germans had lifted themselves up from the dreadful reparations that they were forced to pay during World War I, and that they had taken a new pride in their country. And Mencken was very gratified to see that. But to say that uh, Mencken was in any way a Nazi or that he was a great fan of Hitler would be totally erroneous. Uh, now, in the racism question, uh, Mencken, as I mentioned earlier, he did write against lynching. He did help instigate the Harlem Literary Renaissance. He did publish many African-American authors in his magazine. Behind the scenes, he was helping promote their works. But in the diary, he was using the language that was common of the time. And so this is what people have latched on to. And this is where some of the focus has been laid. And that's a shame because then one doesn't get the full picture of Mencken. But he did come from, in this neighborhood was at the time, a German neighborhood. Yes, it was a German-American neighborhood. Although in his own house, uh, although his family was of German descent. It was an American household. They spoke English there. In fact, his, his father wrote to the, spoke the slang of the day. So, uh, but this was a German-American neighborhood. And Mencken took a great deal of pride in his roots and his ancestors. His ancestors were from Leipzig and were scholars and had published various books. And Mencken took a great pride and went to Germany quite often to learn more about his ancestry. And his byline, H.L. Mencken, as opposed to Henry Mencken. Any reason behind that? Well, Mencken always likes to say this, that when he was given a printing press when he was eight years old, that he ruined the, 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 the typeface for, for, for some of the letters so that he was forced to use H.L. Mencken as his byline. And he said that's how it all began. We'll get a call from Caldwell, Idaho. Good afternoon. Hello there. I'm really enjoying your program about H.L. Mencken, and I thank you. I just wanted to mention Mencken was quite a fan of Albert J. Nock, 
and he wrote a nice endorsement for the Nokian Society in a little book called Cogitations, you may know about it, that came from the Nokian Society that was then located at the Foundation for Economic Education in Irvington, New York. And I just wanted to put that into your into your mixture, and then I, I wanted to ask you a question. Do either one of you people uh, feel like that Mencken's idea, whether he was agnostic or atheist, it seems like that he hated anything that was, oh, he, he hated puffery, you know, whether it was politicians or preachers. And I wondered if, he, if, uh, if the religious nature of government is going to be a religion in our country now, you know, and I wonder if he was here today, if he wouldn't be decrying the religious nature of government. I just, I'll hang up and let you talk about that. Thank you very much for your program. Yes, I think that uh, Mencken would be uh, very much against that. After all, uh, the, the Scopes trial was really a, 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 a trial about uh, not having religion in the schools and to be able to teach science and Darwin's theory of evolution. And so Mencken would be uh, uh, disgusted, really, uh, and, and would want to have the complete separation of church and state, which is what Jefferson wanted. And Mencken, as Vince said much earlier in this program, took his ideals from Thomas Jefferson. In fact, he always said if Thomas Jefferson came back today, he'd be appalled by what he could see. How much of an influence did he have at the Baltimore Sun? Mencken had a great influence in the Baltimore Sun. He was very good friends with Paul Patterson, the, the publisher. He, uh, behind the scenes, he was giving them ideas for story ideas. He was also uh, uh, was a board member of the Sun in later years uh, and directing the policy of the paper. And then towards the end, which uh, readers can find out if they read his autobiographical writing called 35 Years of Newspaper Work, he became rather disillusioned with the sun. He became disillusioned with reporters. He said uh, most of the time they're quitting their work early in order to play golf. <laughs> Fred Rasmussen is with the Baltimore Sun, and we're going to join him live in just a moment or two. But he has been with that newspaper since 1973 and talked to us earlier about the influence of H.L. Mencken on that newspaper. Mencken once said, um, this is a, a paraphrase here, Mencken once said, when I was a young man and my friends were listening to idiot lectures by pedagogues, I was a young reporter on the street. And he found so much in this city that was so interesting, in people. And he felt that this was the life, the life of kings, being a reporter. This was being abroad in the world, doing this kind of work. It's just a privilege, and he, and, he, and he never lost that love for it. Um, I think when I came here, Mencken still was very much a presence in this building. I think younger reporters, Mencken is kind of an antique figure. Um, you know, they, they know the name um, from J School, or they've read some of the stuff, but I, he, he doesn't have, I don't think, quite the impact amongst younger reporters that he once did. Uh, when I came here, I was so excited. Oh, you knew H.L. Mankin? You were with H.L. Mankin? And of course, that's 28 years ago. And there were people here that had started in their 20s who at that point were in their 50s or 60s or 70s who knew Henry Mankin and could talk about him. And it was just great for me to listen to those stories. But, um, but he's still here. I mean, we have that great quote on the, out there in the lobby, which is, I says it all, you know. And from our conversation with Fred Rasmussen, he is now joining us live outside the Mencken home on Holland Street. More than 40 years after his death, is H.L. Mencken still relevant today? Oh, I think so. It's, uh, you know, faces change, stories stay the same. Um, Mencken would find uh, much to laugh at. Uh, Marion mentioned a few moments ago about uh, uh, you know, the kind of religious bend of this administration. And, uh, you know, Mencken, Mencken would find much to a great buffet to dine from today, really. I want to read one. This is a series that takes a look at uh, American history, and what we've tried to do over the course of the programs is look at the writings of leading American writers and get a sense of the times that they were writing about. And in, with history in general, he said this is a quote 
It is the misfortune of humanity that its history is chiefly written by third-rate men. <laughs> the first-rate men seldom any impulse to record or philosophize. His impulse is to act, to live, to him. It's an adventure, not a, not a syllogism or an autopsy. Is that typical Mencken? Well, I, you know, I, I think so. That's very characteristic of Mencken. Uh, you know, I think the whole world of journalism, I think Mencken personifies that, certainly. Uh, you know, they often say reporters are the first people to witness history. Gosh knows Mencken did. Uh, you hear time and time again about Mencken in the Scopes trial, Mencken on Landon, Mencken on Roosevelt. Uh, so that's all still very relevant, and I, uh, I think I would agree with that. I would like to interject something here, too. This is from a 1937 letter to Paul Patterson, publisher of the Baltimore Sun Papers. And I think that any journalist can take uh, real uh, inspiration from these words. He said this about journalism. I do not propose that we denounce the administration incessantly and unreasonably. I only propose that we view it skeptically and refuse to assent to its devices and pretensions until we are sure that they are intelligent and sincere. Every public official with large powers in his hands should be held in suspicion until he proves his case and we should keep him at all times in a glare of light. These are uh, wise words, I think, for any administration. And for any journalist also. And for any journalist. Another 30 minutes as we take a look at the life and writings and times of H.L. Mencken as we get a call from Appleton, Wisconsin. You're next on C-SPAN. Why did he call his journal the American Mercury? He called his journal the American Mercury. Uh, th this, this was a title that was bandied about between George G. Nathan and Mencken himself, but he wanted to put the put the words American in the title because this was specifically an American magazine that discussed the American scene. It was so influential. Uh, later when the New Yorker came on the scene, they, they copied some of the elements of the American Mercury. One of them was Americana, which was uh, little snippets of newspaper articles that were rather funny and uh, which uh, poked fun at different things, and the New Yorker copied this. The American Mercury was very influential to magazines all over the country. Next call, Canvey, Oregon. Yes. Please. Yes, uh, I'm a, a writer as well as a columnist, and I've, I've also had the great opportunity of playing Henry Drummond or Clarence Darrow in Inherit the Wind many years ago. So I fully know the influence of H.L. Mencken. I, and I refer, and I think he's uh, to his works, and I think he was a great linguist but my, and, and writer. But my question is, it, it again goes back to the Jewish issue. I am Jewish. And in one of your quotes uh, over television this morning, or this, this afternoon, you say, uh, part of the quote was his handling, uh, referring to Hitler, of the Jewish question. I know that H.L. Mencken had a lot of Jewish friends, but there's a, uh, I, I've read pros and cons of whether he was anti-Semitic or not. Could you, could you really deal with this right now? Thank you so much. I don't, I, I knew, um, Mencken's nephew, Admiral Abhow, and I know Marion did also, and he was probably Mencken's closest family member uh, who cared about Henry's work and life and so forth. And uh, I discussed this issue with him when the diaries were first published and I was writing a piece for The Sun. Um, Admiral Abhow so was very unfortunate that he used those words to characterize people, but not uncommon in those years. I think it's very difficult or for us, we see them, we're very shocked by them. Um, they, 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 they startle us, and you wonder why a man of, of this uh, brilliance would be using such uh, language. But yet it was very, very common in those days. I think Mencken's life, as Marion and Vince said earlier, points in the other direction. Mencken was a liberating force for African Americans. Um, he had many, many Jewish friends. He also uh, prevailed upon his friends in the consular service in the 30s to help uh, Jewish writers he knew get out of Germany. So I think his life is really very reflective of that. Marion Rogers, why does this issue come up? Uh, we've heard a number of calls on this, and 
you have addressed it in, in your books? Uh huh. Well, uh, because I think that this is an issue that uh, it, it still bothers people today. It was something that uh, people even talked about in, in Mencken's day in the, in the 30s and then later in the 40s. People were wondering why he wasn't writing out against uh, Hitler publicly. He said these things in, in his in his letters and privately, but he didn't write about it publicly. And part of that has to do with World War I and the, the, terrible, uh, the terrible censorship, really, that was going on in the press, the, the, the uh, horrible uh, fury that was being castigated against German-Americans. And he was sentimentalized Germany to such a degree that he didn't want to be one of those who spoke out against Germany. That, that is Mencken's failing, I think, as a journalist, that in 1938, when he did visit that country, he did see cer certain things that were going on, but he didn't write publicly against them. But even so, as, uh, as, as Fred has just mentioned, behind the scenes, he was helping Jewish refugees to escape from Germany. So he's a very complicated man. You can't really go on one side or the other. Like all people, he has his failings, but he also has his positive side. We welcome our next caller coming to us from right here in Baltimore. Hi. Um, can, can you hear me okay? We sure can. Okay. I'm calling literally right up the street from 1620 Holland Street, and I'm very fascinated by um, the program right now, but at my, I have a two-part question. Um, the first question is, what was the overall feeling of Mr. Mencken on the issue of racism and the Jim Crow laws? And the second part of the question is, I don't know if you've announced this or not, but what was the... Um, biggest accomplishment of Mr. Mencken um, during his day or during his time period? The, uh, the, the, the last piece that Mencken wrote for The Sun before his stroke in 1948 was a piece about the, uh, the uh, prevailing conditions of segregation in Druid Hill Park. Uh, blacks could not play tennis with white tennis players and so forth, and there have been a number of incidents where blacks who did play with whites were arrested and so forth. Mencken very strongly came out and said that it was high times, high times such uh, Ku Klux where he was wiped out of Maryland, that, uh, that African Americans paid taxes and they were entitled to use the parks and play tennis with they, whomever they wanted. And so there again, um, at the end of his life, uh, professional life, uh, you see him coming out very strongly on that issue. Um, to the second question, Mencken's greatest achievement. I, I think that Mencken was a very liberating force in American journalism. Um, you look to his magazine work, as Marion and Vince again have said earlier, the, the Menk, they, they, Mencken published a black, uh, blacks when they couldn't get into white magazines, such as the Atlantic Monthly and so forth, participated in the Harlem Renaissance. Mencken was a beacon to a lot of people, uh, both black and white. Uh, great influence in American journalism. Fred Rasmussen, who is with the Baltimore Sun, and Marion Rogers, who has edited a number of works on H.L. Mencken and will be coming out within the next year on a new biography on the author. Two very quick questions. First of all, picking up on the last point, did he shape opinion at the time? Oh, yes. He absolutely sh shaped opinion all across the board. Uh, people. Even when Mencken wasn't writing his articles, he was constantly being quoted and talked about in the newspapers. Uh, he, was, he was a celebrity in his day. And have you been able to calculate the volume of his writings? Oh, well, it's, it's millions upon millions. He wrote over 30 books. He contributed to 20 more. He wrote hundreds of, over 100,000 letters to correspondents. He wrote countless magazine articles and newspaper columns. Uh, new new things keep surfacing to light. He he wrote a lot of autobiographical writings. There's a mass of unpublished material in the Enoch Pratt Free Library. In fact, Mencken took great pride in saying that he was going to keep a bunch of nascent PhD busy for years, and so he has. Including Marion Rogers. <laughs> Marietta, Georgia is next. Good afternoon, caller. Hello. Marietta, Georgia, you with us? Hello. Yeah, go ahead, caller. It's Marietta, uh, California. I apologize. Marietta, California, yes. Uh, two, two parts. Um, 
uh, kind of a fan of Mencken, not as much as my grandfather who was, lived in Emporia, Kansas. So I'd like you to compare and contrast Mencken's politics with uh, that of William Allen White, if, if you know. And second, there's a, a famous uh, quote of Mencken's uh, starts off an editorial, I believe, about persons guilty of golf. And it goes on to describe uh, uh, the uh, shortcomings of those folks. So could you comment on either of those two? Uh, well, Mencken always uh, compared golf to idiocy. Uh, <laughs> they were one and the same word in his mind. Uh, as for uh, comparing him to William Allen White, well, these they were friends. Uh, Mencken knew all of the foremost journalists of the day. They met each other at camp uh, on the campaign trail and on convention at, a con at conventions. But William Allen White was a great, uh, a great supporter of Franklin D. Roosevelt. And as for Mencken, he always said the New Deal has come up with only one novel idea, and that is whatever A earns actually belongs to B. A is any industrious man or woman. B is any drone or jackass. That's the kind of uh, sentiment that William Allen White would not have subscribed to. Baltimore is next. Good afternoon, caller. Uh, hi, this is Dr. Arthur Simon Baltimore. A couple things. I love your C-SPAN. I don't know if you've hit on these in regards to his attitude toward Jews. Uh, I've read virtually everything he's written that's available in bound books, uh, except, of course, uh, the language dictionary. Uh, and uh, I recall him referring to the uh, Jewish boys at City College, where only thing he thought about <laughs> is that they were so damn smart and fast. At the same time, I haven't heard any references to the Saturday Night Club. As soon as I'm finished here, if anybody can refer to that, I remember it very well. I never saw him there, but it was uh, a, a famous watering hole in a, a lovely German restaurant on Howard Street in Baltimore called Schellhauses. And uh, a number of the members of the Saturday Night Club, I, I got to know my daughter was a student at, uh, at Peabody, and uh, I, I think her instructor was a Phil... Uh, Cheslock was there, and they drank beer and had a wonderful time. He was Jewish, and also our, our family doctor, who, who used to make house calls for five dollars, uh, uh, a doctor, uh, Joseph Blum. Uh, he, uh, uh, Mencken played the piano, and, and Joe Blum played the viola. Uh, let me see anything else. I'll squeeze in fast. Uh, I, uh, I, I, lo I loved his book on the prejudices. That's when I was first introduced to it. I haven't heard anybody make references to that. Uh, I've watched almost its entire show today. Uh, the, the Heavenly Halcyon and a third book of days that were bound. And then the one that came out about 35 years ago called the with Christomathy, uh, about 35 years ago. And the last point, and thank you for allowing me, um, uh, when he was married, uh, did he and his wife live on Cathedral Street, if anybody knows? A lot there to discuss. The one book that you mentioned, this is what it looks like in Fred Rasmussen, if you want to comment on the other uh, points that the caller brought up. Try to move from the end to the, to the beginning. Uh, Mankin lived during his marriage at 704 Cathedral Street in a rather lavish apartment with his wife, Sarah Hard Mankin, who, of course, died uh, very young. And then he came back here to Holland Street. Caller, uh, how far, or I mean, uh, Fred, uh, how far geographically is Cathedral Street from where we're located? Maybe about two and a half miles. It's in Mount Vernon, near Mount Vernon Place, right in the center of Baltimore. And, uh, uh, and then after he found life there impossible without Sarah, it's a rather large apartment. Uh, he came back here with his brother August to finish out his life. Uh, the uh, Saturday Night Club certainly was the center of Mankin's social life. Uh, uh, these men were from newspaper men, they were doctors, they were lawyers, they were professional people, and they gathered on Saturday night to play classical music and drink beer uh, and eat, uh, eat um, uh, chopped beef, um, beefsteak tartare, and so forth. And uh, this was a ritual that went on for well, well over 50 years. Um, there was a, there's a great Mencken story of a newcomer who was happily dining away on the beefsteak tartare, and he, and he inquired of Mencken that well, where this wonderful meat come from, and Mencken said they had very good contacts in the pathology department at Hopkins Hospital, and the man kind of turned green. Um, but uh, Dr. Cheslock wrote about the Saturday Night Club in his wonderful book on Mencken on music, and for anyone interested uh, in reading that great book, uh, uh, you'll find more about the Saturday Night Club. Marion Rogers, he 
became a reporter when Teddy Roosevelt was in the White House and he suffered his stroke when Harry Truman was in the White House. How did he view our presidents during those times? Well, uh, Mencken, Mencken didn't like getting cozy with presidents. He thought it ruined a person's objectivity. So he wasn't one who would uh, like to go to the press conference, for example, of, of uh, Franklin Roosevelt and succumb, as he said, to his Christian science smile. But, uh, but, but Mencken also uh, had this to say about presidents, and I have, uh, have a quote for you, and it, it really runs across the gamut of all presidents. He said that, why did men seek elective office in the first place? And he said there was a genuine fear of ideas among Americans and men who had stout convictions and, and strong ideas were really shouldered out of public life. He said eventually they go in once or twice but then they're taken over by the intellectual jellyfish and inner tubes. So he said there was only room for two sorts that become presidents. One was the blank cartridge who has no convictions at all and is willing to accept anything to make votes. And secondly, the Mount Bank, who is willing to conceal and disguise what he actually, actually believes according as the wind blows hot or cold. And he said, the presidency tends year by year to go to such men. As democracy is perfected, the office represents more and more closely the inner soul of the people. We move toward a lofty ideal. On some great and glorious day, the plain folks of the land will reach their heart's desire at last, and the White House will be adorned by a downright moron. H.L. Mencken. <laughs> and as spring arrives here in this Baltimore neighborhood, we'll show you more scenes around the park. You get a call from Westfield, New Jersey. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon. Uh, let me um, mute my TV. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is Dan Gutman, and I happen to be holding my copy of um, uh, the book you were just showing, a Mencken uh, Crestomathy, if I'm pronouncing that right. And uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, chapters in that book is one called Quackery, and um, uh, there's a little something that he wrote in chiro Chiropractic, and... Um, I'd like to read a few sentences because I think it's illustrative of uh, his um, barbed wit. Uh, is that okay with you? Go ahead, caller. Okay. Um, this is called, again, chiropractic. Um, this preposterous quackery flourishes lustily in the back reaches of the Republic and begins to conquer the less civilized folk of the big cities. As the old-time family doctor dies out in the country towns, with no competent successor willing to take over his dismal business, he is followed by some hardy blacksmith or ice wagon driver turned into a chiropractor in six months, often by correspondence. In Los Angeles, the damned, there are probably more chiropractors than actual physicians, and they are far more generally esteemed. Proceeding from the Ambassador Hotel to the heart of the town along Wilshire Boulevard, one passes along score, one passes scores of their gaudy signs, there are even many chiropractic hospitals. The morons who pour in from the prairies and deserts, most of them ailing, patronize these hospitals copiously and give to the chiropractic pathology the same respect that they accord to the theology of the town sorcerers. That pathology is grounded upon the doctrine that all human ills are caused by the pressure of misplaced vert vertebrae upon the nerves which come out of the spinal cord. In other words, that every disease is a result of a pinch. This, plainly enough, is bunkum. The chiropractic therapeutics rest upon the doctrine that the way to get rid of such pinches is to climb upon a table and submit to a heroic pummeling by a retired piano mover. This, obviously, is bunkum doubly damned. Anyway. Thank you for that. Fred Rasmussen, would you call him a curmudgeon? Oh, absolutely. I think he was proud of being a curmudgeon. Remember, uh, he, it was a point of honor with, uh, with Mencken that uh, he, he thought every president from Teddy Roosevelt to Truman was a fraud. I, uh, he loved all that. And um, as Marion said earlier, uh, uh, he felt it was a, a, a journalistic uh, junkyard but when uh, a reporter would go to Washington and, and lose his objectivity and then suddenly liked uh, dining with the president and so forth. Mencken eschewed all of that. Uh, he, he avoided all of that. Um, uh, no, curmudgeon? Yes, absolutely. 
We, by the way, want to thank Jack Sanders of San Diego for allowing us to use a lot of the audio of H.L. Mencken that you have been hearing and seeing over the last uh, hour and 50 minutes, including H.L. Mencken's view on being a reporter. You could no more have a 40-hour week for a good newspaper reporter than you could have a 40-hour week for an archbishop. It's just not possible. A good reporter, he simply refuses to let a story go when, when he's got his teeth into it. And he wants to, wants assignments. I, I, I remember when I went down the office in the morning, uh, it, uh, the, certainly the thing that interested me wasn't whether I'd get a lot of time off and, and go home early, but whether I'd get some good assignments. Mm -hmm. If I got the good assignments, I didn't care how long I worked. I've worked many a time all night. When the Baltimore fire happened in February 1904, I was a young city editor. They dug me out of bed about 11 o'clock in the morning. Said a big fire started downtown. I went downtown. I never got my clothes off or slept until Wednesday morning at 4 o'clock. And we continue with your calls. Los Angeles, you're next. Sir, the gentleman who just read that uh, passage from Mr. Mencken, uh, the boulevard is pronounced Wilshire, not Wilshire, if you'd like to put us down, at least put us down correctly. Uh, going back to the issue of anti-Semitism, uh, the fact that it was pervasive at the time in his works, in works of George Orwell, believe it or not, down and out in London and Paris, in works of Upton Sinclair, in a newspaper that Henry Ford published, Meetings of America First, uh, radio broadcasts of Father Coughlin going on, the fact that it was pervasive does not excuse it. It, it really did culminate in the Holocaust. And when in 36 or 37 they said, oh, there's a Hitler and he's a bad guy, it was too late. Already half a century. Caller, do you think H.L. Macon was anti-Semitic? Well, he was. They were. They are today. Uh, I am a Muslim. And since September, I have seen that happening more than ever before in this country. And it's like trying to describe a pain to somebody who has never had it. You don't even re recall your last headache. How, how can I tell you this? And when you sit here in this uh, re remove from history and try to play with these things, it's dangerous because this is the only thing that we have to really learn from this. It's not that he drank beer or sat in this room or was a funny guy. It is that very intelligent very articulate, very expressive people are often very wrong. People who created this century, Henry Ford, Charles Lindbergh, these people were, were of the idea that this group was dangerous and they destroyed them. They did it. They succeeded. We'll um, get a response from Fred Rasmussen. I can never use his gifts and talent or intellectual abilities to, to punish people of different color or religions um, or ethnic backgrounds. That, that's not what Henry Mencken was about. And if, and if you think that, I think you're misreading Mencken's life. We I... want to thank the Mencken Society, which has allowed us to uh, incorporate a lot of the photographs that you have been seeing over the course of the last uh, two hours. And also the folks in this neighborhood, Union Square neighborhood, and the Baltimore Police Department, which have uh, cordoned off a part of Holland Street so that we can provide you with this program and the folks in the neighborhood, indicative of a Baltimore neighborhood today? Yes, uh, very indicative, very close-knit families and homes are very important to Baltimoreans. They always have been, and this is why Mencken loved his city. Karen Fretz, Frank Travato, Tony, and Jana Prado, among those who have helped us out over the course of the preparation for this program. We'll get another call from Minneapolis. Go ahead, please. Miss Rogers, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, I was in a used bookstore, and I bought a book I'd never heard before or seen before, although I've read a lot of Mencken. It's called Menkeniana, and I'm sure you've read this book. It's 1928 by Alfred Knopf. It's published by Knopf, and it's 131 pages of insults and one-liners about H.L. Mencken. And he obviously accumulated these and edited them down, and they're absolutely hilarious. 
And this is the point about H. L. Mencken, about why we read him today, why we return to him. It's not because he's a bigot. He doesn't tell us anything about the Israeli uh, Muslim situation in, in in the Mideast today. He doesn't tell us about about uh, race relations. He is funny. He's hilarious. He had a great sense of humor, and especially he told us about the twenties. Thank you. Yes, that book actually sold quite well. It was one of the biggest sellers of Mencken's books. But I would like to go back to that caller because uh, he, he says an important point, but I would like to raise this question. Uh, Degas, the great painter, was said to be anti-Semitic. We don't stop looking at his ballerinas or horses at the National Gallery. T.S. Eliot of the Wasteland uh, was also said to be anti-Semitic, and we don't stop studying the Wasteland in our schools. And likewise, Mencken, for all, for all of his faults, and this man was not a saint, but for all of his faults, he provided a liberating force into this country. He helped us see ourselves as we had not been seen before. He helped many people with their civil liberties, and that is why we celebrate him today here in Holland Street and at Union Square. So I take your point to that caller, and I realize that he's a, he's a funny man, he's a wonderful man, but he's also a very complicated man, and maybe that's what makes him so fascinating. Our next call comes to us from Scottsdale, Arizona. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, I'd like to ask Ms. Rogers, in reading Mencken, as I have over the years, it has always impressed me that his uh, achievements in writing about the presidents and his dialogue seem to be more impressive of our founding fathers who became presidents than uh, those of the 20th century from from Theodore Roosevelt all the way through uh, to um, Franklin Roosevelt. That's my first Thank question. You. And could you comment? Thank you, caller. Yes, uh, as I mentioned earlier in this program, and I think Vince has too, Mencken held as his ideal uh, the founding fathers, uh, certainly Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. He found them gentlemen, he thought they were literary, and he thought that they, they held to a man's sense of self-reliance and individualism, and that's why he celebrated them so very much. One more call, Indianapolis. You're next. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm just uh, have not uh, been quite satisfied with the biographer's responses to some of the callers' inquiries about Mr. Minkin's social views. Um, I think that to say that his language was common for the time seems a little bit apologetic. I think there are any number of prolific writers from that time that uh, that did not take on the reputation of being anti-Semitic or racist, and uh, I'd just still like to get a clear answer as to, and certainly I would think that the biographer understands where those, where that reputation comes from. So if she could address that a little bit more clearly, I'd be uh, possibly satisfied. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll take the challenge, and I hope this response satisfies you. One of the uh, failings that I see of Mencken is that as I mentioned earlier, when he went to Germany in 1938, he was such a sentimentalist about the home of his ancestors that he was blinded to the fact that many things were occurring against the Jewish people, especially at this time of year, the spring of 38, when, uh, when, when many of them were being ostracized and, and pulled out of their homes. And Mencken did not write about this. Mencken did not, he mentioned it to, few times in letters home to the United States, but he didn't write about it. Dorothy Thompson was. Other journalists were. These were not people who uh, were, uh, uh, were, were radicals. They were writing about what they saw. Mencken refused to do that. That, to me, is his great failing as a journalist. Fred Rasmussen, would H.L. Mencken recognize today's Baltimore Sun? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think he would. I think... Um you look at our our A section or Telegraph section uh, would be shows his hand still at work. Um, our foreign coverage, the editorial page is still rather bouncy and sprightly. Uh, that's a uh, legacy of Mencken's. Um, if you go back and look at some of those Sun editorials from years back, uh, they were as heavy as a sacred bag of sacred concrete. Um, no, Mencken's Mencken's influence is on the paper still there. 
You have been with the newspaper for how long? 29 years. Fred Rasmussen, who is joining us outside the Mencken home on Holland Street, thank you. Thank you. And Marion Rogers, what is your connection? Joining us outside the Mencken home on Holland Street, thank you. Thank you. And Marion Rogers, what is your connection with the Baltimore Sun? Oh, well, my, my husband is a columnist for the Baltimore Sun. His name is Jules Whitcover. Uh, but I would say that Mencken's great le legacy is uh, the liberating force that he provided into this, into this country. He was saying things that no one dared write about. And I think it's a testament to Mencken that people have been calling in today, they've been quoting from his prose, they've been laughing over his humor, and they're still riled up about Mencken. And that's just exactly how Mencken would have wanted it. How would you describe his style, his writing style? Oh, well, it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, he, he said that people used to write to him and complain that they had to look up words in the dictionary. His, uh, his, use, his words, he once said he knew over 25,000 words. But his, his style is alive. One, someone once said that uh, reading Mencken increases your will to live. It's absolutely alive, and there's been a lot of imitators since then who try to write like Mencken, but there will only be one H.L. Mencken. And as we conclude our look at H.L. Uh, Mencken, what was happening during the times that he was writing, and what kind of an influence did he have during that period? Well. Uh, he personified the 1920s. It was a time of big business. But as F. Scott Fitzgerald once said, America was going on the greatest, gaudiest spending spree in history. But it was Mencken who reminded us of the Bill of Rights. Then in the 30s, Mencken, of course, lost some of his popularity. More people believed in the social programs of Franklin D. Roosevelt than Mencken did. But he came, gave a comeback back in the 1940s, and certainly by the time he turned 75 during the 1950s, uh, Mencken again was reaching new heights. And in the research that you have been doing for the book, which will come out within the next year, year or so, what startled you the most? What did you learn that you did not know before going into that project? Well, uh, that. I, the, not many things about Mencken surprise me because uh, I've been living with a man for about 20 years in the course of all the books and research that I've been doing. But uh, it has given me a new appreciation, I guess, for Baltimore, for the, for the love, the tremendous love he had for this city and for his home and, uh, and the tremendous love he had for this country. Mencken may have loved Germany and had many of his roots there, but he loved this country, and he was about a, uh, as American as apple pie. Marion Rogers, we thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And Judy Cooper, we want to thank from the Enoch Pratt Free Library, which has also helped us out in the research for all of this. Maura Pierce, who has produced this program here in Baltimore, Mark Farkas back in Washington, Eric Hansen, and a very, very dedicated crew of people who have been here behind the cameras, running the audio, and making sure all of this goes well. Technically, we want to thank them. All of it supervised by Gary Ellenwood. We're going to leave you with more of the words of H.L. Mencken. He completed his formal education at the age of 15. This is what he said about his life as a reporter, as we thank you for joining us from Baltimore. I never went to school since, thank God. Uh, most men that escaped college have a, a regret that pursues them. But I must confess I'm much too vain to have any such regrets. I think of that what I was doing when the boys of my generation were in college, listening to idiot lectures and cheering football games and doing all the foolish and silly and useless things that college boys do. I was a young reporter on the street, and I believe... How old? Eighteen. I believe that a young newspaper reporter in a big city at that time let a life that has never been matched on earth.
American Writers continues live on Sunday afternoon with our look at the life and works of F. Scott Fitzgerald.